issues. Um, we are now turning to the ways the policy and projects are being done, communicated, evaluated and studied from gender perspective. Um, this is outcome of a three-year project of, um, funded by ESF and the project focuses on equality of men and women in Czech foreign policy and development assistance. Um, as elsewhere, looking behind the curtains of a theater may tell us a lot about the play itself and looking at the internal side, which may sometimes seem procedural, um, may tell us in the end a lot about the substance itself. My name is Petra Lidolákova. I have worked for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for 15 years, mostly in areas of human rights and international mechanisms for their protection. As of this year, I became a member of the team of Common Foreign and Security Policy of the Ministry. It's my pleasure to welcome our today's panel. Um, let me introduce to you from my right, um, Ms. Lenka Vochovcová, PhD lecturer and researcher of Department of Media Studies, Faculty of Social Sciences, Charles University, Prague. Ms. Katerina Kočí, a lecturer and researcher of Institute of International Relations, Prague. Mr. Tomáš Dopita, PhD senior researcher from Institute of International Relations, Prague as well. And Ms. Blanka Niklova, researcher from Gender and Research Department, Institute of Sociology, Czech Academy of Sciences. Welcome all. Knowing that you all have in front of you uh, bios of all our panel today, I will take the liberty of going straight into the substance uh, without longer introduction of our panelists. A uh, little info time-wise, uh, we have 90 minutes for the whole panel, uh, which gives us 15 minutes for each of the presentations. Uh, after each, we will use several minutes to briefly hear and answer your questions and comments. And we will start in the area of development cooperation, where a crucial term is project management. Uh, how well is the gender perspective embedded in project management and communication? Our first panelist, Ms. Lenka Vochovcová, uh, will deal with communicating gender equality with implementers of the Czech Development Cooperation. The floor is yours, Lenka. Okay, thank you. Okay, so good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I will be presenting here uh, the results of the analysis I conducted for the Czech Development Agency and uh, my task was to conduct uh, qualitative content analysis of the external communication of the agency uh, and also the perception of the implementers of the Czech Development uh, Cooperation or or eight. So, um, as for the research design, the methods, I was conducting qualitative content analysis of uh, the materials of the Czech Development Agency, their website, Facebook page, press releases, uh, also websites of the implementers, but I will not be presenting uh, these results here now due to time constraints. Um, in this content analysis, I was focusing on gender sensitive language on uh, representation of women and of course men as well in the content and uh, on any presence of gendered perspective in the text. Uh, and another part of the analysis uh, constitute, was uh, constituted of semi-structured interviews with implementers. Uh, altogether eight people, uh, five women, three men, represent, uh, representing uh, seven institutions. And in this research I was asking them about their personal and organizational approach to gender issues, uh, about the possibilities of uh, implementation of the gender issues in uh, their practice, uh, also about the institutional frame, how their institutions perceive the relevance of the topic, and I was asking them for f uh, feedback to the Czech Development Agency as related to their uh, requirements. Uh, Okay, <laughs> this is kind of a, a hyperbole, this is a man's world as a result of the analysis of um, the external communication of the Czech Development Agency. Uh, you can see some pictures that I have deliberately chosen uh, to show the man's world. Um, but uh, the hyperbole is um, one thing, uh, but uh, the analysis an is another. Uh, the texts are full of generic masculine, uh, 
especially related to experts, teachers, implementers, lecturers, those important people. Um, and in Czech, it is important whether women are represented in language as well. So they are not uh, represented in these texts uh, in language. And if we uh, put it together with the predominance of all male photos, as you have seen um, on the page and in the press releases, uh, and those men are mainly those who sign contracts, again, decide, implement, uh, then we can see that the, the perception of the representation of women in the communication um, can be uh, concluded as, uh, as a man's world, uh, a world without women. There's also a significant lack of gendered perspective um, there where it would be relevant. Um, gender issues are almost invisible, they're not being stressed. Um, an exception is the Facebook page where from time to time you can have the impression that um, they care about gender uh, very much, but it's usually uh, due to sharing of international campaigns focusing on, uh, on gender issues. Uh, this is only for Czech-speaking uh, audience, but I'm asking uh, whether the Czech Development Agency is only hiring men, because uh, when they are offering new uh, jobs, um, oh, again, generic masculine is, is uh, the form they are using, like this, for those who can uh, read it in Czech. And um, I found out that uh, when women are present, uh, in the content, they are usually used as tokens, uh, especially in visual, visual materials. You probably all know the tokenism means um, appointing a token number of, uh, under of people from underrepresented groups uh, to, to somehow um, deflect criticism. So here an example with female canines. Uh, probably, you, I don't know if you can see it properly, but there are smiling women uh, put in front of the pictures and behind them there are uh, only men who are really working in the field, like in, in, a, in a dominant number. And now uh, let me turn to uh, the results of the interviews with implementers. So implementers' approach to gender issues, um, it's very individual. Uh, the people were chosen by the organizations uh, to be do the most informed in the field of gender, but despite the fact uh, the level of the gender expertise uh, differs significantly. Um, generally, the perception of gender approach is very narrow. They usually uh, connect it with uh, equal employment opportunities, uh, or flexible job offers for parents, mainly uh, mothers, uh, in, their, uh, in their interpretation. Uh, gender perspective is perceived mainly as focusing on women's interests and benefits. So with this, um, let's see, um, war between sexes. And uh, many of them are skeptical uh, as related to the importance of the topic. Uh, a quote here that I have chosen says, the gender perspective is overestimated. Um, and especially people who work with technic uh, in technical fields and natural sciences, but not exclusively them, uh, do not feel like experts in the field. So it's difficult for them to, to implement gender perspective anyhow. Uh, the discourse on gender issues among the implementers is very contradictory. On one side, many of them are able to, to identify gender inequalities, especially at work. Uh, but on the other hand, they are uh, pronouncing many gender, gender stereotypes. I have chosen a few of them. Some, some were saying that they doubt that women are interested in, the, in these jobs and positions, meaning that women are not those who would be interested in leading companies and, and uh, working in the field and so on. Another of the stereotypes, um, women have a better sensitivity to administration and men, of course, work in the field, uh, of course. <laughs> and uh, also, uh, th there were stereo negative stereotypes uh, related to men present mainly in the expressions of, of the women, uh, such as men typically involve their ego in the problems, they are full of complexes. Um, what I found out is that the implementers put stress on equivalence issues, uh, meaning that they uh, take care about equal representation of men and women uh, as, as the bodies. Uh, but uh, there is a lack of understanding of the importance of differences and, and uh, a gender-specific approach there where differences uh, are, uh, are important and are somehow uh, crucial to, to the fieldwork. Uh, this all results in, uh, in gender blindness, 
in uh, the implementation phase rather than in, in something like gender sensitivity. So I can see a huge potential here for education and training of, uh, of the implementers in gender sensitivity. Uh, they also offered uh, feedback to the Czech Development Agency. Um, what they were saying is that they are lacking information about how to implement uh, the issue. What are the expectations of the Czech Development Agency? Saying that nev they never know what to fill in and they don't know uh, whether the agency evaluates uh, their projects based on what they filled in in this, uh, in this part of uh, equal opportunities or gender section. They are lacking feedback and also the understanding of the relevance of the gender perspective in their work, saying that no one ever offered me feedback, like telling me this is not what we expect you to do, we expect you to do this and that. And um, that's why they perceive it merely as, as a formality. They fill in something just to uh, fill it in. And some of them also said something like, uh, it's good that uh, the Czech Development Agency are not obsessed with the topic because if they were obsessed, there would be a problem because we don't know what to fill in. Uh, but on the other hand, there were also uh, people who perceived the relevance of uh, the gender topic as very high, and for them, the Czech Development Agency is lagging behind other, other donors. Um, they say that the topic is absolutely necessary, you cannot do development without it, uh, but they do not feel pushed to, to implement gender issues in what they are doing. Um, and they, of course, take care of uh, the more pushing topics um, from their perspective, of course. Um, one of them said that all the big donors require gender analysis as an obligatory assignment, and in this sense, the Czech Development Agency is uh, lagging behind. They were also uncertain about the motivations and gender expertise of, of the agency, saying things like, um, I do not know if they actually know what they expect us to do. So that, that's another thing to solve, I think. Um, and some of them were asking for specific uh, instructions, specific aid, uh, like manuals, uh, workshops, training, uh, sharing good practice in this field, which would be helpful for the, for the implementers to be able to, uh, to somehow work with uh, gender perspective. Um, Many of them mentioned that if gender perspective is to be uh, included in their work, it has to be there uh, since the beginning, from the very beginning of uh, the project design, uh, because you cannot put it there, uh, there later. So it has to be part of the uh, lock frame of the project. And for that, uh, they said they would need uh, a thorough gender analysis in the field to be able to, to work with this, uh, this issue. Um, so they came to some barriers to gender perspective implementation they perceive in their work. First of all, it's their lack of expertise in gender issues. They do not feel as experts, as I said, so they basically do not know what they could do. Not all of them, of course, but, but many pronounce this. Uh, they also mentioned institutional barriers on the side of their institutions, which do not consider the issue very important. Um, then there were some fields in which, the, especially the women, felt uh, like being discriminated against, even in the Czech Republic. Um, and uh, some of them said that it's just another problem to solve for the, uh, for the institutions, so it's merely a burden. Uh, cultural aspects of the receiving countries were mentioned as well. Their perception of gender issue as non-important, pushed by the European Union, uh, and so on. And um, a very interesting uh, mention was that they need to uh, respect a certain order of priorities. Uh, one of the interviewees said that um, implementing gender represents step C, whereas we are uh, in the face of step A. We are uh, somehow establishing the field in a country where it doesn't exist. Uh, political barriers, if uh, they feel that if they want to change something in the receiving countries uh, concerning gender issues, they will need the cooperation of the state, of the legislative, of um, the national budget also. Uh, so they find it very difficult to change something substantial. Um, and last but not least, uh, financial and time constraints. Um, Almost all of the interviews mentioned that it's really expensive to conduct a thorough gender analysis. 
and uh, that it makes no sense to focus on the topic in short-term projects. Um, they hesitated whether with, with the CDA budget it's possible to implement gender uh, meaningfully. And uh, the last uh, quotation of my, of my presentation says, question is, do we really want to focus on this in short-term projects? Because gender projects should be long-term, continuous and conceptual. So I think uh, there are a lot of questions to be solved and um, mainly communication between the implementers and the agency could improve, I think. Thank you, Lenka, for the critical picture and also for some hints of um, forward-looking proposals on uh, how we could do better. Um, now I'm offering the floor um, to the audience. Thank you for coming in this um, just after lunch time. Uh, we are not many. If some would prefer sitting um, just in front of the podium, feel free to move. And um, for those who already have questions or comments, the floor is yours. And if I don't see any raised hands, nobody violently asking for the floor, I'll use um, my position as moderator and ask first. Uh, so, collecting this vast experience on how our development cooperation works, um, if you were given this chance to do one quick fix, where would you start? What would it be? I would probably get inspired by um, the replies of my interviewees and I would um, push some training, education, workshops where they can together talk about how we can implement gender perspective in uh, the development cooperation. What does it mean? Uh, how wide the perspective can be? That it's not only counting bodies. Are there enough women? Uh, but um, the topics are much more specific. And some of the implementers, uh, thanks to the knowledge of the field, uh, really had good ideas how to, how to work with this. Hmm. Thank you. Yes, I see first raised hand. Take the floor, please. Sorry, I just wanted to ask, uh, and uh, these results, did you present them to the development agency? <laughs> sure, I will present them in an in, in a, in a analysis which will be much more detailed than, than this presentation, of course. So they will get the results. Thank you. Speakers from the audi uh, audience, please uh, identify yourselves. I saw Camille Pickel. I can identify you. Uh, Kamil Pikal, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Department of Development Cooperation. Uh, I have one good news. I don't know whether it was reflected in your research. I don't know in what time did you do it, but there is a new methodology on evaluation of, of gender aspects within the projects. We suppose it will be projected in the future into the, uh, let's say, into the formulation of new projects because it sets some targets, sets some indicators, so maybe this will help to, to improve in the future. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> That's exactly what the implementers were, uh, were asking for, like indicators. They, they were mentioning that we have no indicators. We don't know what to do if there are no indicators. So that's a good news. <laughs> Thank you for that. You, you already are moving towards the second, um, uh, our second presentation today, but I'm still giving last chance to ask um, Lenka. Okay, so we are moving on. Um, and now we, we will indeed look towards possible future measures. Um, one of the future set of measures would be a proposal for gender statistics. Um, is it correct? Tomáš Dupita, the floor is yours. Jmenuji se Tomáš Dopita, jsem z Ústavu mezinárodních vztahů a tato prezentace se, vlastně, se bude týkat našeho nedávno proběhnutého výzkumu o zjistitelnosti genderově relevantních dat v projektové dokumentaci České rozvojové agentury a myslím si, že 
nám poskytne příležitost, a, abych, ta, abych tak nějak reagoval i na to, co tady říkala Lenka. Jenom pro obecný kontext, genderová témata jsou v rozvoju, rozvoji a rozvoji, I'm, I'm sorry, I forgot, I should present in, in English. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, so uh, I'm very sorry. Oh. So that was the joke for the beginning. <laughs> yeah, uh, and uh, this presentation is based on our research on uh, the on the gender relevant data in the, in the documentation of uh, produced in the uh, project cycle of the Czech Development Assistance. And I think that this can uh, offer us uh, some opportunity to uh, make some uh, references also to uh, Lenka's presentation. Just uh, for the general context, uh, gender issues are in the development already since the 70s, and gender statistics, uh, at least uh, from 1995, from the Peking Declaration and Plan for, for Action. Uh, then uh, many um, international bodies and uh, development agencies uh, um, started with their own gender equality or women's uh, empowerment policies. Um, yet, uh, we have to say uh, in general that uh, these um, uh, words and rhetorics uh, 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 remained mainly rhetorics uh, because uh, many um, evaluations and meta-evaluations of uh, uh, development agencies show us that these uh, promises were uh, rarely matched with uh, allocation of resources uh, which, uh, uh, which could uh, provide us uh, opportunities to monitor and measure, measure actually uh, the gendered effects of development in the field. Um, uh, actually, what is uh, the trouble is uh, what like uh, academic work shows us many uh, um, many instances when uh, the Western aid or internationally funded development cooperation actually helped uh, uh, to empower men in in the target societies. Uh, so. Uh, this is like a, a problematic thing when we help, we think that we help somewhere, uh, but in the end we somehow change the power relation, gender power relations in the receiving society without even knowing that uh, or reflecting on that. So the idea behind this project and research was that gender statistics or a systematic collection of gender relevant data uh, can uh, contribute to long-term improvements in programming of development uh, in general uh, of development projects, uh, identification of development projects and formulation of the projects and their monitoring and evaluation. Uh, uh, on the method, what we did actually, we gathered uh, an, uh, a set of documents of key documents on uh, altogether 96 projects uh, that were implemented under the auspices of the Czech Development Agency between the years 2009 and 2000, 2017. What we analyzed there is uh, all gender relevant information in the data set, anything that is gender relevant and uh, what, what was gender relevant was anything that went beyond the uh, narrow categories uh, grammatically of gen generic masculine. So anything that was written in a, a different way than generic masculine, we, we took note of it, we uh, gathered it and then we analyzed it. Uh, overall findings, um, gendered information is there. Uh, but it's uh, generally incoherent and uh, it's contingent. It's here and there, but it's not really um, coherent or systematic. Uh, 
what is interesting that in half of the project, uh, gender was ignored or avoided by declarations of gender neutrality or non-discrimination. Here it's important to note that uh, in the uh, documentation there is actually a mandatory section which is called um, equality of men and women and uh, the implementers are actually expected to fill in something over there. But uh, uh, we can note that uh, in many cases this is just not filled in. Or there are these uh, uh, phrases uh, saying that the project is gender ne neutral. We don't expect any gender impact. Uh, or uh, this project uh, uh, does not uh, discriminate, discriminate against women. And that's all um, what we can read there. What is also interesting that in uh, the other half of the projects, gender was used actively. What, what I mean is that the project documentation actually presented concrete information about the project or about uh, the lo local context. Um, uh, so um, let's forget about the passive uses uh, or the, the, the empty uses of gender and let's focus on the active uses of gender. So in, the, in those uh, uh, 95 projects, in 25 case, cases actually uh, the implementers described the implementation of the project. So they uh, reflected either on the participation of men and women in the implementing team or on the participation of men and women among project beneficiaries. Uh, and in 13 cases, the implementers brought out gender relevant information on the local context. Uh, but what is uh, interesting as well, and we need to know it, note it, that these active uses of gender did not follow any clear rules. It was, uh, it was not really uh, easy to find them. We really had to uh, uh, fish for them and uh, there was no uh, coherency in this, in this, in, in this information. Uh, the other analytical finding which we find very interesting is that in 23 cases, we, among these active users, we actually observed uh, a clear promise uh, that, the, that the project will improve the situation regarding gender equality or women's empowerment. Uh, most of these promises, however, uh, did not uh, provide a concrete information that could help us to confirm or justify the promise. So there was usually a promise, but there was nothing for us to find out if the promise was fulfilled or not. Or not. Uh, in all these uh, 96 projects, only six projects altogether actually put forward some concrete information on how many men and women participated in the project activities or benefited from the project in any way. Um, so uh, the conclusions uh, are somewhat similar to Lenka's conclusions in that uh, the implementers uh, did not really have or do not really have a clear idea about what information uh, to submit. Uh, it also seemed that uh, no one really required such, a, such an information, no coherent information. Uh, however, uh, if we take what we gathered from these uh, 95, 96 cases, then some information uh, we gathered was very interesting. It provided uh, closer insight into the project or the context of their implementation. So we could uh, get some information on really how many men and women uh, were invol involved in this activity over there in Ethiopia or in Moldova, which was interesting. Some, sometimes it was uh, gender equal. Uh, sometimes it was highly gender un unequal. And um, then we can say, th two things about this. It's great that they submitted this information because the second thing is it opens questions about this project and its context. How is it possible that, for example, in 
this project, let's say, for example, in Ethiopia, there is only 5% uh, uh, of uh, participants that are women, and the rest is men. Um, and uh, relevant, uh, concerning the context of the in, uh, implementation, we could find out repeated uh, mentions about, for example, some cultural issues and things. Uh, for example, in Ethiopia and Mongolia, the uh, collection of water and the task of bringing water to home is the responsibility of women over there, uh, which makes uh, the issue of water sanitation and uh, these issues of getting clean water to people high, a highly gender relevant issue. It all, for example, it opens many, many questions. Uh, for example, uh, we provide them with clean water, a uh, source of clean water, but what will women do with, uh, the, uh, with, with the time they get? Uh, for example, they don't have to spend three hours a day uh, by fetching water, but what will they do then? Some of them will maybe stay at home uh, and they will lose the only time they had for themselves. Uh, th that's just my speculation. It's just what I can say about it from this uh, perspective. Uh, the other thing is what we, can, we, we found is that, for example, some sectors in Moldova are highly feminized. Social care, like in the Czech Republic, uh, education, not uh, a higher education as well, and but also the Moldovan uh, agency, for, uh, national agency for statistics. It's really highly uh, feminized. This opens other questions. Uh, for example, how uh, the working and social rights of women over there are uh, fulfilled or not. Uh, and concerning the proposal, uh, so we proposed uh, in our study actually uh, to let the implementers to answer to three uh, key questions uh, which are very really simple and which are which are actually already usually already there it's not it's nothing that uh, they they have to uh, do um, thorough research on uh, they just need to count it uh, and write it down and uh, quite often in some cases we found out that they actually have these numbers but they were not really asked to submit them and therefore they didn't submit them uh, so uh, this proposal wouldn't really uh, burden the implementers with much of extra work and if we w were able to systematically collect this information uh, then uh, we could uh, follow long-term trends. Uh, the first question is simple. How many men and women is involved in the, in the implementation of the project and what role do they play in the project? The second one is how many men and women were direct beneficiaries in the project activities? Uh, this uh, in, involves, for example, trainings, uh, and other, other ways when people on the ground or in the field really got something from the project. Usually uh, the implementers, they, they, they have their own lists uh, and they, they would be then able easily to provide it to, to the agency. And the third pro uh, question is, uh, is there any gender relevant information about the local context that is important for the project's implementation? Uh, if there is n none, then they don't have to really fill it in. If yes, then they should specify it. This, this uh, question could offer us a possibility to systematically uh, collect information on, on the local context so that uh, this information doesn't get lost. Uh, uh, the implementers, they spontaneously already provide this information so uh, this is just the way how to take note of it. Uh, this is just a proposal and we will see how this will, this will live in the Czech Development Agency and uh, in the Czech Development the Assistance and Cooperation in general. 
uh, it's a question of um, of future, really. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Tomas, for this um, rather critical picture of um, the issue of gender statistics in Czech developmental cooperation. Uh, well, uh, they reflect traditional stereotypes and bias of our society as well as of, as of societies of countries where, where projects are implemented. Um, so, uh, will the statistics uh, do the trick? Will they, um, will they manage to get us from the, let's say, vicious circle of not knowing uh, gender aspects of um, uh, projects in developmental cooperation? and not uh, then focusing on um, the impacts um, the projects have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in my opinion, um, what, uh, what this research has shown is that actually we do, we do not know much uh, right now, uh, even in terms of the, the plain category of men and women. Um, and if we were to know this, then we can follow the ge general trends and then we can really start to reflect on what we are doing and how we could do it better. So uh, I'm calling this strategy um, Harden the Soft uh, and I, I can explain it. Uh, in development assistance there are the, the so-called soft projects but then there are the so-called hard projects. Hard projects are those that build technology uh, units and, and stuff like that, and they are measurable. Uh, they, they, they have quite high, this, this, this kind of projects has quite high status. Uh, also because we can really measure and then present the impact and the improvement, the, the development. Uh, but uh, once we don't know anything really about the soft projects, then we can't do these things with them. So I think at least at this general level, we, if we can, if we were able to collect basic uh, sociological and uh, cultural data systematically, this could really help in the future. A, a, at the moment, there is uh, actually nothing like that. Thank you. I'm again opening the floor for, and yes, Mr. Pickel. So, Kamil Pickel, Minister of. <coughs> Foreign Affairs uh, Department of Development Cooperation. Uh, I would mention again our new methodology. I would really draw your attention towards it because the set of indicators there is is really impressive. You have uh, nearly hundreds of different indicators you can choose, targets you, you can measure for various projects such as number of girls and women who received education, number of girls and women who receive access to drinking water or whatever else. And um, so this thing is a real improvement, improving and generally speaking, if we speak about statistics and analysis, they must be somewhat appropriate to the scale or size of the project because they could not form, let's say, half of the budget. So I appreciate that this, this tool is really simple, can be, can be implemented quite easily. So thank you for it. Thank you. Would you like to answer anyhow? Or yeah, I can just comment on that, that this was the goal, to provide some simple tools and it was actually based on, not on uh, some uh, indicators or measures that were, that would be imported from the outside, but it was, it is basically based on what is already there in, in the documentation. This, uh, uh, following these questions systematically in the information system of the Czech Development Agency and in the uh, documentation as well could then provide a powerful instrument to really collect this data and to start to really uh, reflect on those processes as uh, one system uh, systematically yeah so it seems that that here we might achieve a quick improvement and we are already in the process of it right and again the floor is yours Adam. Well, yes. Uh, generally okay. speaking, the methodology is uh, dealing with evaluation with, with projects that are already done. But it's public, and we, we suppose that in the future, the new new projects that will be formulated will be written with knowledge of these indicators. And so we suppose that within 
one, two, three years, there will be some measurable, measurable pro progress in this field. Thank you. Thank you for that positive note. Unless I see anybody else from the, the audience. Or would you like Blanca? Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Tomasz, for uh, the presentation. Uh, I think your contribu contribution was like really very important. Uh, I think it's actually quite shocking that only 6% of all the, or actually less than 6% of all the projects that you reviewed um, seemed to possibly have some positive impact on um, uh, gender uh, perspective. Uh, so that's just a comment. Uh, but um, uh, I do have a question as well. Uh, out of the three questions uh, that you propose, uh, the third uh, one to me seems uh, a little conspicuous. It seems to imply, at least uh, the way I read it, that there are um, actually um, local contexts that do not carry with them like any gender relevant you know, information. Is that um, deliberate or? Um <laughs> so uh, let me first just comment on your comment about the 6% or six projects. It's actually, we don't really know if they, if it is, it has improved or not, but we, uh, we can say that they actually provided uh, some coherent information, which, which would really, which, which can tell us like there were this, this many men and this many women. Uh, yeah. Uh, the other thing is, yeah, um, in the logic of the, our research and the proposal, we didn't really. <laughs> Uh, gender is everywhere, you know, uh, so um, we, we can s spend uh, endless days on uh, like collecting data and discussing it, but it, this this was uh, the logic behind this question is that if they are, if they have and they us they often and they sometimes they have if they have this need to for example justify their proposal with mentioning some gender relevant data or uh, explaining some some issues in the project proposal or inform uh, implementation by providing context relevant uh, gender relevant data then we should be able to collect this information so the logic behind that was not to force the implementers to to write uh, uh, essays on how the situation is over there or over there, because what we uh, f are facing in the Czech development assistance is actually uh, uh, this uh, unfortunate irre irrelevancy of gender. Uh, when it's everywhere, actually this uh, section is everywhere, uh, but uh, everyone perceives it as something that needs to be somehow bended or avoided or or uh, uh, stepped over, uh, somehow tricked. Uh, that's uh, so. The logic behind this question is: if there is some uh, need uh, among the implementers to to tell us this information, then we should be able to collect it. If there is no need, no such a need, then let them be silent on that. Thank you for that. And uh, Tomáš is staying on his spot because he will be doing the next presentation together with Katarina Kočí. Well, um, as we were told in diplomatic, uh, sorry, uh, I see one more hand raised. Take the floor, please. Uh, first of all, thank you, Tomáš, for the presentation. Uh, my name is Lenka Aldorf. I come from the UN department here at the ministry. Uh, I actually have three questions for you. Um, I would start with the methodology. I was wondering how are you actually selecting uh, the 96 projects? Uh, because there's definitely not all of them that were available, I guess, for you. Uh, second, uh, I wanted to ask about here, about the proposal, um, because uh, as you mentioned, the, the scope of the project is obviously very wide, but I'm a little bit missing uh, the question on the women involved in the actual design of the project, because it seems to me that this is kind of most important part to a degree, because if the project is well designed with women in mind, then the implementation should, should theoretically run smoothly. 
Um, and the third question that I was wondering about was whether you had a chance uh, to actually compare uh, some of your results with evaluation reports from those particular projects that you were that you were reviewing, and whether you found some like some interesting facts for us to share. Thank you. So the first question was regarding methodology. Uh, it was a cumbersome pro process. We were actually quite a few people working on that. Uh, and uh, we, we had this idea that we will uh, collect some coher coherent data set, but this wasn't actually possible um, due to constraints on the side of the Czech Development Agency because the system they have now, it uh, has been implemented just uh, a few years ago and uh, the information on the projects uh, is uh, not systematic at all. So we, we had to use a person inside of the agency to go uh, via intranet or ask specific people whether they have this and this information and then we collect it. So we, in the end, uh, collected as many projects as we could uh, within some time frame, then we said stop, and then we analyzed it. So we couldn't say that we have some uh, really representative information for some time span or for a certain country, uh, but we could say that we have followed some general trends. So when I mentioned these uh, uh, issues of avoidance of gender issues, uh, actually. Uh, we can say that it, uh, there are some sectors in the Czech development uh, assistance and this uh, was shared among all the sectors. Also the active use was shared among the older sectors, all, all the sectors. So we couldn't, say, we couldn't really uh, present any argument for a specific sector or for a specific country for, or for a, s a specific year, but we can say that we have some argument for uh, the Czech development a cooperation in general. Yeah. The second question was uh, concerning this uh, in, uh, uh, formulation phase of uh, the Czech project cycle, and you are right. And this, uh, I'm uh, presenting uh, this proposal as we submitted it, but uh, then we got in touch with, with people from inside of the Czech Development Agency and this actually, this question was added there and it's actually now the first one and it focuses on uh, on how, uh, how many men and women and in which, in which positions were involved in, in the formulation of the project. So this is solved and then uh, uh, with uh, the uh, co the issue concerning the question concerning the evaluation, me uh, personally, no, I have not become acquainted uh, acquainted with uh, with this data. But again, uh, people from the from inside of uh, the agency they reflected uh, on it a bit. Uh, there were some projects that that we analyzed and they were also evaluated, and generally, I got the feedback that somehow we got it right to some extent and that uh, it, some of these issues uh, are mentioned already in the, uh, in, the, in the evaluations but there was no, no systematic reflection on that during the project and research. Yeah. Thank you for that. So let's move to our third uh, presentation. All negotiations are always and first of all, about negotiators. Um, as diplomats always say, substance comes only second. So it's about um, negotiators, their personalities, egos, experience. It's not by coincidence that the UN Convention on Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women devotes a separate para to women's participation on foreign service. It's not only peace negotiations that prove time and again that women bring with them different dynamics, um, sometimes different issues or different aspects, um, strengthening the sustainability of results of negotiations. I still remember not so distant years when Czech women diplomats were not allowed to continue their posting abroad during maternity leave. 
when our diplomats abroad did not have a health insurance, preventive care in diplomacy was not covered by ministerial health care scheme, neither was the cost of medical care during childbirth, should it amount to anything above the price of a return ticket to the Czech Republic. I'm glad that we can call these grim facts witnesses of the past, and hopefully we can head towards a brighter picture. Or not yet? Um, Tomáš Dupita and Katarzyna Kočí will tell us more about the gender inequalities in the foreign service. Floor is yours, Tomáš. Yeah, so, uh, hello everyone again. This time I will start in English. Uh, and this is actually a brief presentation of a forthcoming uh, publication. It will be published in Czech la language, but maybe we can also uh, transform it, transfer it, translate it in English in the future. Uh, I think like if we translate it in English, it will be something like inside diplomacy, how to deal with gender inequalities in the foreign service. Um, let me just start with some notes on the internal dimension of diplomacy, what I mean by that. Uh, because uh, diplomacy has been traditionally used for external relations. Uh, but it has often been forgotten that states' external relations have their internal dimension. Uh, and uh, this forgetting uh, can have some implications for, for the external uh, relations themselves. I will come back to it later. Uh, what, what we know right now is that modern diplomacy has been dominated by men. Uh, it wasn't like that always. Uh, in, in the older times, pre-modern times, and there were uh, women diplomats, uh, or what we could understand as diplomats, and they uh, were holding quite high positions. But uh, we, when the modern states were uh, formed, uh, women were uh, suddenly excluded uh, from diplomacy. Uh, there were even formal bans of, on women in diplomacy or, for example, on married women in diplomacy. It's not that long ago that uh, these bans were lifted. Uh, so currently, in most cases, diplomacy uh, in most states is open to women, but its internal structures are still usually male-dominated and gender-separated. I will illustrate it later. Uh, so, uh, the idea behind uh, this study and publication is that undermining the male domination in diplomacy is not actually only good in itself, but it promises actually a better use of talent and an increased ability to project lib liberal democratic values, human rights, and etc. in external relations. So, it's not only for those people, but it's also, it can also improve our foreign policy as such, the quality of it, the effectiveness of it. Uh, uh, the Czech example. This is a, a Czech example, but this data can be really gathered on, I think, nearly uh, every foreign, policy, uh, foreign uh, service in the world. Uh, for the, so, in the Czech example, a woman has never been a Minister of Foreign Affairs not even in Czechoslovakia, not even in Slovakia. Uh, in uh, 1988, there was actually only a single woman director of one service department, nothing else. In the higher echelons of the hierarchy, no woman. Uh, then in 1990, uh, women started uh, entering the diplomatic service uh, and their share increased incrementally but uh, it stopped in 2008 uh, and then it, it slowly decreased or varied but uh, we have not seen any uh, steady improvement since 2008 uh, and uh, just some numbers in 2016 there was only one female deputy minister among nine, nine male deputy ministers 33 percent of female deputy directors and only 18 percent of female heads of foreign missions on the gender separation, we can also uh, say that accountants 
assistants and consul consulate officers are female generally in the Czech Foreign Service Embassy. Operatives, drivers and cooks are male. Uh, there, uh, there has been some intellectual and academic work on, on this issue. It has not been much and it concerned uh, the, um, um, uh, like the first arguments on and actually uh, the taking note of male domination and prejudices, prejudices in foreign service and uh, we have seen some uh, autobiographical texts on what it takes to be a female diplomat and then recently it was just published uh, an edited academic volume o on how diplomacy has been gendered, uh, published by Agestam, Agestam and Tones. Uh, but uh, so there is this general uh, agreement on then that uh, diplomacy and foreign service, service has been male dominated. Uh, but in this publication we are trying to make a step further because we have noticed that there have been actually countermeasures and counter initiatives. So we followed these counter, counter initiatives in the practices of foreign services and we tried to gather them and put them together and uh, make a study of that. Uh, so based on this method or focus, we identified all together 12 different measures that have been or could, uh, could be taken to counter the tradition of male domination in foreign service. So now I will just like list them or maybe uh, yeah, it concerns institutionalization of equality inside of the institution of uh, foreign service, uh, affirmative actions, gender sensitive HR, human resources management, uh, flexibility of work, but also alternative family policy, right for motherhood, healthcare, legal status of family members, insurance of family members, working life of spouses, ch children's education and cooperation with spouses associations. Uh, on overall findings, I, um, I, I would dare to, to, to say these two main things, that uh, if we uh, take a foreign servi service in general, then we can say that in most cases, the extensive politicization and constant circulation of personnel makes the foreign service into a very uni unique social field. By politicization, I mean that uh, positions in foreign service are often, very often, awarded to some politicians, some people who um, did something in politics, they served uh, in some way, and then they are dropped into the system. Then we have also uh, uh, diplomatic academies and people who take the uh, bottom-up route and uh, they try to make their career, but there is also this strong politicization. And the constant circulation is, uh, concerns the thing that people in foreign services, they, they often go abroad and then they come back, and they go abroad and then they come back. So there is not much stability inside of, of foreign service or ministries. Therefore, this problem, problem needs a very special approach. So uh, we need to look for tailor-made measures that usually could not be found anywhere else. If you take some g general measures used in some other ministries or, or in general and you try to apply them to foreign service, then often it, this does not work. Uh, and I will end by this and I will ask, I will give the floor to Katerina who will focus on some yeah. concrete issues. Uh, uh, yeah, that's it. So, good, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I will continue the presentation of Tomáš. Um, I will actually uh, focus mainly on practical level and on the measures that Tomáš introduced uh, in our publication. But first, um, 
we, this project is not only the publication, but we also launched a project before it, uh, it, uh, it has been since 2015 that we actually try to analyze, analyze uh, different diplomatic services, foreign services worldwide, well, worldwide. We focus mainly on European countries, but we also, for example, include the, U the United States. So I, uh, I had many interviews with diplomats uh, from foreign services, but also with the uh, department of HR department of the ministries of foreign affairs and so on. And from those data, we actually try to uh, focus on the, uh, on the main measures, on the 12 measures that Tomasz introduced. Um, I will first will tell you the reality, which uh, in one number that was uh, present in the, publication, in the publication since 2018 was 15. 15% 15 of women of as ambassadors were currently uh, were, were currently in the world. I mean, uh, Anton in his publication in her publication she made a huge analysis of different countries and she came came up with the number fif, uh, 15 of uh, as a representation of women in the highest management position. Uh, we couldn't have this outreach. We didn't have so much countries analyzed, but this is just an example that, for example, in France, 28% uh, is, are currently working as, uh, of women currently work as ambassadors. In the UK, it's 21.5%. Uh, in the US, it's 18. There are many reasons for that. We already heard some of them. Uh, which are connected to stereotypes, the fact that uh, women are usually seen as not uh, uh, sustainable or not uh, suitable for the high uh, diplomat positions. But uh, from my perspective and the interviews that I did um, uh, for several years was uh, that women have, um, ha are often seen as homemakers uh, and they have a huge and very problematic relations regarding the regarding their reconciliation of family and working life. That's one of the main issues of family. And so some of the measures that were taken and that I'm going to focus more uh, later, it's the family issues, the, the life of spouses and children, which have to go obviously abroad for the posting with, together with the diplomat. But for, uh, first, in the first part, when we talk about this representation and how the countries uh, deal with the issue, so at the beginning, ma many of them, or some of them at least, started with the affirmative actions like quotas. So, in the, since the, there are some laws, for example, in France, in Austria, that actually uh, uh, draw, uh, uh, that are added also in, into the, that law. Uh, the quotas, like in France, it's about 40% of women that has to be at a uh, highest position. In Austria, 50% of women. Um, there are some, uh, those are quotas which are obligatory or they have to be uh, achieved in one or, well, in five uh, to, well, two to five years. In case of the EU, for example, in case of the UK, they have 40%, but those quotas are rather, well, those are just recommended numbers. Those are not obligatory numbers. So, for example, in France, um, uh, we have also other activities of the ministry. We have, for example, the parity committees, the gender parity committees, and in case of Austria as well, that actually follows, for example, the selection procedures. They or even, for example, prior prioritize groups with a lower representation, usually women, during the selection procedures, if they are uh, equally qualified as men or, or for for a specific position, for example. So those are uh, some basics, basic actions that some of the countries take, have taken throughout the time. Uh, there are other activities and actions, like for example, the fle flexible for, uh, war forms of work, which, however, when I, uh, when I saw the, the data from different countries, are only available at, in the headquarters, not really in the embassies or during the postings. The, there are very, very little possibility to have a flexible form of work at, at the embassies. In general, well, almost no country that I analyze had those possibilities. Uh, another possibility how to help can, uh, how to help diplomats women diplomats but especially uh, because obviously in families of diplomats some of them has also husbands diplomats so 
in order to help them, so they have the job sharing, for example, there's another option that one, uh, one diplomat uh, serves for one year or two years and then he switched with his wife or husband. Um, so that's another possibility. Um, as I said, and very important, very important thing for for women in order to decide to go for the posting or to uh, to be a, a diplomat at the first place, it's the family, uh, obviously. And one of the reasons why family and the issue that actually was present in many, many interviews that I had with diplomats was uh, well, first the partners of diplomats, and then the children. Partners uh, have a very difficult time when go abroad. They first have to adapt with the new environment, with the language and so on. But it's a, uh, the, the major problem is the fact that they usually are or find them themselves in a different environment and they are unemployed. There is for, for them it's not that easy to find a job abroad for a limited time period. So this unemployment is a very, very important, important thing as well as for example another thing and then that's dependency on its uh, on its uh, uh, partner diplomat. The dependency is also uh, viewed, for example, from the perspective of the money allowances that the partner receives, because it's always on it goes on the banking account and as a part of salary of diplomat in many countries. The reason being that um, the partners have no any official status with the ministry, which finally uh, means that they are totally dependent uh, on on the diplomat and on either husband or wife. But as I said during the interview again, another thing that struck me was that not really a lot of men actually go and is willing to go with uh, with their wife diplomats abroad. That's very uh, well. If you, I ne never did the concrete statistics, but um, it really is a small number. So that's why that's a, a major, majority. It's about women which follow their husband, and they are in this position, unemployed and in a new environment. And, f and and another thing, our children that obviously have to also change schools, language, and environment and social ties. So I search for some kind of best practices, and one of the best practices, uh, I'm not going to uh, very, uh, very detail about that, but there is just one country currently in Europe that I found that has the official status with partners or with spouses, and that's Estonia. Since 2007, in their uh, foreign act, they have this uh, possibility to, f uh, to sign an agreement with, uh, with a partner so that this partner can, be, uh, can have his allowances on the banking account, which also includes him to the social system, and that has other consequences as well. So that's the only country. Another one welcoming probably is Poland. Regarding the uh, the employment, there are other activities that were that were done by other mainly foreign uh, foreign countries that I analyzed, like for example signing bilateral agreements with uh, different types of uh, either uh, multinational companies or st uh, or countries, so that ca the partner can uh, the partners are able to work in the uh, in the foreign country. The other one is, for example, to employ partners in the, uh, at the embassy, which is not always possible because the embassies are small, there is a lower number of staff. But, for example, in Germany they find a way, uh, they uh, employ them as liaison officers, so those that actually are in contact with families, and um, well, especially with the families abroad. There are other uh, other possibilities like to create an update list of places where those people can find the job. But I think, for example, the bilateral agreements worked quite well. Or well, actually, when discussing again with, for example, the uh, many, many diplomats in different countries. So those are the possible actions for, um, for partners. There are some possible actions for, for children as well. For example, uh, what I found here in the Czech Republic, the kindergarten is not paid, yeah, uh, but in many, many countries, again, uh, that I analyzed were paid, and, um, uh, well, especially the last year, the kindergarten, also the schools were paid in full. So, again, 
this helped uh, the families to somehow manage all the finances and also to manage the schools. There was one very, uh, very interesting case again in Slovenia. They also pay for the the au pairs or nannies, so that's uh, or babysitting as well. So that's also very useful, especially because parents have to work after the kindergarten and and they have to work also in the afternoon, so they ha cannot cannot pick up the children before. So that's so uh, that's those are just very br brief um, kind of introduction to the problems that we and measures that we we were dealing with, uh, with in the publication. Uh, well, if you want to read more, you can then see our publication when it's actually really published. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Katarzyna and Tomasz, for this um, still rather sober picture um, reflecting least some positive um, examples that uh, could uh, work as a food for thought and maybe for our gender focal point uh, or maybe also for the intra-ministerial um, working group for equality or equal opportunities that used to function in this ministry though it uh, hasn't met for last several years. So the floor is open, please. Hello, I'm Peter Pirunchik. I work um, here at the MFA. Uh, it seems like a very good analysis and description of the situation, and it is very good actually because the public, the public needs to know what the foreign service is about. Actually, it's not just about receptions. Uh, but uh, my question is. Uh, quite obvious. Uh, are you planning uh, on uh, coming up with some recommendations uh, fitting to the Czech MFA? Um, it uh, would be a logical step uh, and uh, if uh, you start it with the description you should come up with uh, a, uh, a recommendation of a solution too. Uh, well, we, this project actually started, uh, well, in 2015, not as a publication, but actually some kind of cooperation between the Ministry and the Institute of, Foreign, uh, of International Relations that we were, we, we were asked to make a project where we will focus on specific issues like, for example, uh, the health insurance. Uh, the health insurance for not only for for the diplomats but also for their for the partners and children for the la uh, for uh, re regarding the question of labor and the parental uh, uh, par uh, maternal and parental leave and so on so we had some very specific questions which were already studied in the foreign countries but also in the Czech uh, uh, at the Ministry of Czech Republic and um, some as what I heard that some of the some of the measures that we proposed in the project was were already implemented. So the, in the Foreign Act, the new one that was like two years ago, he was that was published. That, so they are some some uh, some things that were already implemented regarding, for example, the the partners and sp spouses, the fact that they um, are able, well, they can be part of the social 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 system, that they have their allowances. But there is, for example, the thing that we, that I mentioned with Estonia, the fact that they have the official status, for example, that's something that many many countries want to achieve in the future, or at least the association of the spouses, but unfortunately there is no willingness from the other side, probably not in many countries, so um, that would be also, I think that would be one of the measures that I would say it's good for the, for, for the, for the ministry to have some kind of agreement with the spouses in the future, because it helps them a lot in order to be part of, uh, well, part of the posting, part of the, either part of, part of the embassy or not that dependent on, his, on her or his husband when they are abroad. Uh, they are always, I, I would say that in, in, in this, in, in this gender, uh, well, gender issue, there are always small steps that can be taken. It's either if the ministry allows, for example, to pay for the kindergarten. I know it seems like a very, very concrete and practical and no, well, but it has a huge implication for, for women to come, to, they can, can, can back, come back earlier and so on. So, so there are f steps that can be taken and they are even in the Czech Republic, but well, it always takes time and people 
because not all, all are agree with uh, with those terms, obviously. Thank you for that. Um, any more comments or questions? Yes, please. Yes, thank you for the lecture. It was really interesting. Um, I'm Anna Seiter from University of Groningen in the Netherlands, and I wanted to ask, um, maybe a bit related to this, um, well, you, you, you have said mostly like practical solutions how to improve the conditions that women can actually also work, but I wanted to ask, do you think that there are any steps to take so to like go against the stereotypes which you said are also like a big challenge for women to work in this field? Like, to improve the mindset of, well, which is dominating in this area? I think that again, small steps will may may help in uh, in to do the, some big steps in the in, in the future. So if you start with uh, just one problem, you start to deal with it. Like for again, family issue, as I said, it's one of the most problematic because then the the women are not are are are, are well, they are stopped somewhere on the level and they cannot move further in the um, uh, on the level uh, on the next level or on the in the highest level. So that means that if you start with uh, with some of those so you will start also breaking some of the stereotypes because then women can have possibility to be there on the high on the higher level but well that's that's always about making priorities in in the women's life so please Tomas yeah, I have <coughs> a short comment on this that in this publication we uh, dedicate one chapter or sec section to alternative family policy, which means that we are actually focusing on that a lot of these measures, for example, for, ex for example, flexibility of work, concerning the flexibility of work, they actually focus somehow on women and they allow them to work more and care more for their family. But this alternative, which perhaps goes against the ingrained stereotypes is that uh, the family policy should also f focus on uh, parents, uh, on fathers, on fathers care. So uh, like uh, somehow socializing ourselves and uh, internalizing that even in diplomacy uh, par uh, fa fathers can take care of their children uh, could help in improving uh, the situation of their partners. So, for example, in this case, we are thinking about that. Yeah. Thank you. Would you like to close or no? We are moving on then. Last but not least, um, how and by whom international relations are studied, analyzed, and explained shapes also how many angles to reality are really seen and reflected. Blanka Niklova, with her um, somehow ominously named contribution, Czech International Relations, where have all the women gone? The floor is yours, Blanka. Thank you. Um, so, good afternoon. Uh, I know that we're running out of time for this panel, well, a bit, okay. Take it easy then. Take your 15 minutes. <laughs> okay. So uh, I'm presenting a study that uh, we conducted together with my colleagues Nina Farova and Katarzyna Zilinska. We all work at the uh, Institute of Sociology at the Department uh, of Gender and Science. And uh, what our department generally focuses on is uh, gender in the content of knowledge. So what we know and how we know it and how does uh, actually gender um, uh, interfere with this. And uh, we also focus on um, who are the people uh, that uh, work in science, what implications uh, might this have for what we know? Again, so that's that's pretty much the focus. Um, so, uh, what uh, we were sorry, okay, uh, what we were tasked uh, with uh, uh, doing uh, for uh, the Institute of International Relations uh, project uh, was uh, uh, finding out why uh, there's a dearth of uh, women among uh, international relations researchers in the Czech Republic. Uh, because that's quite evident that uh, there are very few um, uh, women researchers um, uh, in the area of uh, international relations in the Czech Republic. Uh, we um, did uh, semi-structured interviews with uh, students uh, 
of all levels at uh, an international relations department at a public university in the Czech Republic. Um, however, we focus specifically uh, on uh, PhD students because they are the ones uh, that have the greatest potential for actually continuing on uh, and becoming, uh, uh, becoming uh, IR researchers. Um, the background for uh, our analysis uh, comes from a large-scale project uh, of our department uh, that uh, strives to map um, uh, the Czech academia, uh, and it was conducted uh, from uh, 2017 till 2018. Uh, it was both quantitative and qualitative. Okay, so the key question, of course, is why should we care uh, why there are so few women uh, in um, uh, international relations uh, research? So um, uh, one of the reasons is uh, um, because gender perspective uh, is accepted in global international relations. Uh, it is accepted as uh, a critical perspective, uh, but it is also accepted as uh, part of uh, work and teaching environments. Uh, so that means uh, that uh, um, when uh, we consider gender in international, international relations as a research area, uh, we should also um, uh, start thinking about how people feel in the area, whether uh, the environment that they meet with uh, in the given discipline uh, might have some gendered aspects, uh, some uh, gender dimensions uh, that might possibly, for instance, work as barriers uh, to uh, people who uh, perform a certain, uh, certain gender. Uh, the problem uh, also is that uh, the local uh, impact of both these uh, strands of thought uh, is really rather limited. So what you can see uh, in this slide, or perhaps not see so well because the screens are so small, uh, well, what you can see here are um, uh, screenshots from uh, the International uh, Studies Journal and uh, the Global Politics Journal uh, when I did a um, uh, search for the word gender uh, in the archives. So that means that uh, um, uh, I think the, the, the earliest article uh, in the uh, Czech Journal of International Studies comes from 1998. And in those 20 years, there were only six articles published, uh, uh, out of which four were actually book reviews. So um, it's actually like really very, very limited. Um, okay. Um, so. Um, just to give some background information, uh, international relations fall into uh, the broader uh, field of social sciences and humanities. Uh, so um, uh, just to kind of uh, give some sort of uh, yeah, tip of uh, what uh, uh, the study that our department did uh, on all of uh, uh, these in the Czech Republic. So what we found there was that uh, there is a, a very strong, uh, very strong vertical and horizontal segregation in the field, meaning that uh, uh, when it comes to vertical segregation, um, uh, there are uh, actually a few women in uh, the leadership, so you will find very few women, for instance, running departments uh, at uh, higher education institutions. When it comes to horizontal segregation, what is meant by this is uh, that there are specific subfields uh, that may be feminized, however, the main field uh, or the core subfields uh, tend to be rather masculinized, so that that, that would be what uh, also applies to the area of international relations. And uh, uh, the example that you can see behind me is uh, um, uh, um, a table showing, a chart showing uh, that uh, um, it's mostly men who make um, 40,000 or more um, uh, crowns per month uh, in uh, Czech uh, social sciences and humanities, uh, disregarding uh, which uh, type of uh, organization uh, you look at. This is based on quantitative data and it's representative for uh, uh, the Czech Republic. Um, despite this, uh, what needs to be said is that um, um, people that work in social sciences and humanities um, uh, positively assess uh, the um, work-life balance uh, options that they are given uh, in the field, uh, although uh, there are very clear gender divisions when, within these fields. And these tend to be, in general, uh, paid less attention uh, com uh, compared to technical sciences, for instance, or natural sciences, where like women in STEM, that's a really big topic, um, there is not that much attention paid to, to other to other fields, although, as you can see here, um, we probably should pay some attention to these fields as well. So I will now uh, go right into the findings. Uh, I will start on a positive note, yeah? uh, but then I will move on to uh, some uh, barriers that we also identified uh, from the analysis of uh, the interviews that we conducted. 
So when it comes to positive factors, uh, Students that we talked to um, are very well uh, aware of the fact that uh, uh, gender um, and the gender perspective is uh, an established topic uh, in the global field of uh, international relations. Um, they may be a little more hard pressed to, to name uh, the fields, but some of the fields uh, that, uh, that are uh, specifically affected uh, by this perspective are feminism in teaching, gender and how it affects careers, uh, but also gender as a critical uh, research perspective. Um, then uh, what needs to be said is that uh, some uh, students, but also researchers in uh, Czech uh, um, uh, international relations are open uh, to um, the gender perspective in international relations. Uh, and this, uh, if I went back to uh, uh, the literature review, uh, can be manifested on the fact that uh, there have been several high quality review articles, starting with the one by Teresa Kodičko, uh, published in 1998, uh, that uh, tr tried to kind of kick start uh, a discussion uh, on uh, gender in international relations, but it just seems not to catch on somehow. Um, and then uh, what also needs to be highlighted, and I think well, this whole panel has served uh, uh, to highlight this quite well, gender is considered in uh, some uh, areas, specifically peace studies and development. Yeah. Um, However, there are also structural barriers that uh, uh, the students and uh, women specifically who want to actually carve a career in international relations research uh, tend to run into, specifically in the Czech context. So uh, we have a structural barrier of how um, higher education funding is uh, um, done. Uh, there is lack of mobility within, uh, within uh, the departments and uh, the discipline as such is actually relatively small. There are few people in it. So what this leads to is uh, petrification of uh, departments and the problem is that since they were established in the 1990s um, as uh, small and almost all male, this petrification means that it's really very difficult, uh, very difficult for women researchers to uh, get a position uh, at the departments, almost impossible in some cases. Um, the data also show uh, uh, that there is both the Matthew and Matilda effects uh, uh, described in the SDS. Matilda effect uh, refers to the fact that women have to constantly prove themselves. They have to repeatedly prove that what they are saying is actually backed by data. Um, and they are cited less uh, in academic journals, whereas the Matthew effect is the uh, opposite of this. So that means, means that if you're a man researcher, uh, actually um, uh, you are um, um, more likely to get published, uh, more likely to get cited, more likely to get promoted. Uh, and this is something that we can also see here in the Czech Republic. Uh, there is this old boys network, although in fact it's young boys network here, so the men are not really that old <laughs> yet. And then uh, because the discipline is so, so small, uh, interpersonal uh, relations tend to play a really big role. Um, and uh, it is uh, these that students very often blame for uh, the shortcomings of the discipline as such rather than structural barriers. There are also disciplinary barriers uh, in the discipline, so um, uh, that uh, means that although feminist international relations strive to actually um, uh, apply gender sensitivity in all research done within uh, the area, um, uh, the um, Czech international relations um, um, research is uh, very highly uh, compartmentalized. That means that uh, um, gender is segregated into very small specific areas where it's kind of safe to publish on it, it's safe to talk about it such as development, as we could see here today. Um, uh, but when it comes to the other topics, uh, uh, say, uh, I don't know, um, the intelligence community, for instance, uh, which also interferes actually with diplomacy, I was quite surprised that it was not mentioned because they also interfere, right, with, with who gets appointed uh, and who doesn't. So this is not, uh, this is not a sub-discipline where you would actually be able to find gender that much. The problems that this leads to include the fact that gender is um, uh, reduced to women, so we're not really talking about gender, we're talking about women, that's not the same thing though. Um, uh, there is a lack of consideration uh, for gender relations in empirical studies and also of gender as an analytical category in uh, theoretical and epistemological studies, again the literature review manifests us, and then uh, there is also a lack of attention paid to how gender affects the work environment and dynamics um, uh, and also the classroom setting because it also plays a role there. Um, so what are the effects? Um, 
So if we look at the gender perspective um, and uh, that being omitted, uh, we can see that um, uh, it is almost absent from the syllabi. It is only present in um, uh, classes uh, that are uh, optional, so students can actually graduate uh, from the department that we studied without really being touched by the topic, uh, which is a real problem. Uh, and it is really conspicuous if you think about the fact that um, uh, post-structuralist approaches are named among those that are really influential. So how could that be if you then don't do any gender studies? I really don't understand that. Um, then students also uh, understand uh, international relations as a gendered uh, field very strongly. The metaphors that ten they tend to use for describing this discipline uh, are very, very gendered. Uh, actually, when Tomasz was talking about soft projects and hard projects, again, this is a very loaded metaphor um, uh, and it is highly gendered, so, so, so that would be a good example. Um, um, there is a very strong normalization of a gendered understanding of the discipline that's definitely connected to this. Um, um, that means that uh, um, the ideal uh, or the norm is believed to be uh, one of a fierce, strong, uh, self-assured uh, researcher who is ready to criticize others, uh, who tends to believe uh, that uh, his opinion is the best one. Yeah. The problem, of course, is uh, then that uh, when you ask uh, students uh, to, to do this to, to one another, um, uh, socialization, gendered socialization, will probably hamper women's involvement. Uh, and finally, good, a good finding, positive one, is that uh, students are actually quite open to uh, gender issues and discussing gender issues, but they don't really know how to do it. They don't know how to approach these. Um, then when it comes to the work environment of the given department, uh, we identified a very strong rivalry uh, at the department between uh, academics and uh, um, the unfortunate fact that uh, uh, the rivalry gets um, uh, translated into um, how students are treated. So that means that uh, if uh, uh, someone you don't like in the department has a student they supervise, you are actually very critical and hostile to the student. Uh, and indirectly to the, to the person, which is of course very unprofessional, but it happens. Um, uh, I mentioned already the fact that students are actively asked to criticize one another, which again will conflict with most femininities found among uh, um, uh, the, the students. Um, then informal meetings are also, like, they are very important for um, uh, being able to actually get some sort of position, although all of these positions will be very contingent. And this is much easier for male students because the people that run the departments are men, so that's, that's another uh, issue. And although sexism seems to be fairly limited, it is still present at the department. So I will f uh, finish off with uh, some uh, recommendations uh, that we managed to put together. So we believe that uh, both uh, women and men students uh, need to be involved much more in research projects at the given department. Uh, women students should be uh, actively sought out and supported to counter the effects of uh, gendered socialization. So this is really uh, something that teachers uh, ought to start thinking about. Um, uh, inter uh, interaction um, uh, in general between teachers and students uh, should be increased. Uh, it might help to formalize this, but this is really something that the department should uh, try to figure out. Um, uh, feminist perspectives need to be a stable part of the syllabus, uh, not uh, only part of specialized courses. This just won't do. Uh, and um, uh, the teachers should also consider uh, feminist approaches to teaching, um, uh, most specifically, and I see that as uh, the minimum that should be done, is uh, uh, sensitizing uh, the, the professors to, to gender, what it is, how uh, it should be approached, how it should be taught about. And finally, uh, the petrification of the given department, but it's not only the problem of that one department that we studied, um, it's something that should be very carefully considered when uh, uh, making hiring decisions in the future, um, uh, because the gender makeup of the faculty simply needs to change. It really shouldn't stay the way it is. And yes, it may mean that uh, some of the men professors might lose their jobs. Yes, that is what it might mean. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Blanca, for this um, vivid portrayal of why it's still rather men's world in international relations. Um, there is one last chance for brief comments or questions from the floor.
and if I don't see anyone, then I'll just thank everyone. Uh, we are closing the panel on gender issues in foreign and international relations. We heard of challenges our development cooperation faces in this particular area. Uh, we heard many hints and suggestions on how we could work better. Uh, we heard of difficulties in promoting diversity in our foreign service, as well as in international relations. As a diplomat, let me express some hope that diversity will receive the support that it deserves. And women diplomats, as well as uh, women political uh, analysts and scientists, will feel supported to get both career and family. Um, the whole of foreign service and international relations alike will profit. Women and men alike will profit. As our teamwork will be able to reflect many more angles to reality. Uh, many more experience and perceptions of our world and, and we will also tap into the powerful source that the today still underrepresented half of population offers. Quality of our foreign service, um, quality of our development cooperation, of international relations, but also our work-life balance options uh, depend on it. I'm convinced that we can do better. Many thanks to our panelists uh, for the inspiration they all offered. And thank you to our attentive and active audience. Good afternoon.